Glory to God. Beautiful presence of the Lord here this morning. Praise God. I mean, I know He's always here, but sometimes it's just more tangible than others. Praise God. So, thank the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tim. As always, great job. Thank you, Suzanne, for Peter, for leading us in worship, and Mike and Suzanne for doing all the uh, other stuff that they do that nobody really knows about except if they don't do it. Praise the Lord. So thank the Lord for that. Amen. And thank all of you for being here. Good to see Rick again. Good friend. Haven't seen for a few years, but good to see you again, buddy. All of y'all, friends, family, praise the Lord. Great to have you with us. And all of you uh, joining us on Facebook, we appreciate you uh, being a part of the service. And you certainly are. It's, uh, distance is no big deal for God. I mean, we're all in the same spirit. So uh, we appreciate you joining us and being a part of the service today, wherever you're watching from. And uh, we love you all and appreciate you being a part of the service. We're, if you have prayer requests or any of those things, you can always let us know. And we're more than happy to to share those with each other and certainly with the Lord. Praise God. So, amen. God bless again all of you for being here and uh, appreciate it so much. And these are weird times we're living in. Praise the Lord. Kind of reminds me of the 60s without the drugs. Just, just, just crazy, you know. Praise the Lord. But, uh, yeah, I just saw signs on the freeway. You know, they're so stupid. You notice how weird they are, you know? It's like they have a sign that says, uh, orange cones mean men at work. Really? I mean, what else could orange cones mean? Psychedelic witches are embedded in the asphalt? <laughs> I mean, really. I saw an interesting statistic the other day. Ants can carry 20 times their body weight which is great to know if you're moving and need help carrying a potato chip across town. <laughs> Just keep that in mind, so praise the Lord. So all this junk that's going around now, I mean, I wanted to go to Paranoids Anonymous meeting, but they wouldn't tell me where it was. <laughs> I feel a little awkward about that, but that's just life, isn't it? Praise the Lord. You know, you're not paranoid if they really are out to get you, right? <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, God is great. Appreciate, again, you all being here and uh, sharing this time with the Lord and with one another. Praise God. So I want to go right to the Word of God this morning and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to, to, how to begin. But uh, let me just touch on this first. And uh, if anybody disagrees with me or their theology is more accurate than mine, that's fine, but I had a conversation, Eric and I had a conversation Wednesday, we were talking about this, and it, and it came up, and um, so I'm going to share it with you, but anyway, let's, let's look at this, uh, Peter, in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And I'm going to just bounce around here a little bit, and then I'll get into the, to the message itself, but I just wanted to touch on this, because it is part of what we're talking about here. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, then in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, uh, verses uh, 13 through 19. And I'll just say this, first of all, I always... For, for whatever reason, I assumed that this was a historical thing that we're talking about. When in fact, I believe now that it was, it was just a prophetic word. Because the book of Ezekiel is like Isaiah, it's all, it's all prophetic. And so I had read this in the past and, and thought that it was God kind of giving us a history of what had happened when in fact he was prophesying something that would happen. And so maybe you're already on board with that, but I wasn't. So. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. This is speaking of, of Satan. And uh, every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond barrel, onyx, 
jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane, a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, our old covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. All right. Then... Revelation 12, verses 1 through 12. Now a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to read this from the uh, Message Bible, but this is Luke 10. And this is where Jesus is talking. You know, he sent out 70 uh, disciples. And he told them to, you know, don't take a bunch of stuff. Just go. And if, they, if you speak peace to them and they repeat peace back to you or give peace back to you, then you stay there and so on and so forth. Well, they came back and they said, wow. This was incredible because the Lord, everywhere we went, we saw the devil and his demons scatter, right? Because they went by the anointing of Jesus. They went by the power of his spirit on them, right? They hadn't received it, but the spirit was on them to accomplish these deeds. And so they did. And then in, in verse 15 or 16, excuse me, Jesus says, the one who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And rejecting me is the same as rejecting God who sent me. The 70 came back triumphant. Master, even the demons danced to your tune. And Jesus said, I know. I saw Satan fall. Now what Jesus is saying here is a repeat of the prophetic word that took place back in Ezekiel. Right? Jesus is speaking this. He saw it prophetically is what he's saying. And so he says, I, I saw Satan fall as a bolt of lightning out of the sky. See what I've given you? Safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. No one can put a hand on you. All the same, the great triumph is not in your authority over evil, but in God's authority over you and presence with you. Not what you do for God, but what God does for you. That's the agenda for rejoicing. Praise the Lord is what he says. Hallelujah. So praise God. Now, the, the, the reason I say that is because when Jesus ascended, what did he say? I go to my father. Why? Because he had to take the blood to sprinkle it on the real 
ark on the real mercy seat, right? So when Jesus, and here's what the Lord spoke to me. This is what I believe God was saying to me. When Jesus ascended to the throne, that's when Satan was kicked out of heaven. And the reason I say that, for one reason is because now the scripture says in, in, in uh, Revelation that he's the one who always accuses the brethren. Well, he's not accusing us before God anymore because we have been redeemed. We went to heaven with Jesus. We were seated with him in heavenly places. So we overcame the devil in Christ and the devil was cast out of heaven. He's no longer in heaven. He's here. He's operating here on earth now. Amen. Except where the church dominates, where the church rules. And so when Jesus ascended, went up to heaven, Satan was cast out. Therefore, there is no one. No, listen to me. Nobody is accusing you before God. It's our own conscience here on earth where the devil still can rule and reign, but not in heaven, not in the heavenly places. We're seated there in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. There is no accusation against you, not for anything you've ever done, not for anything you will ever do, because God does not allow the accuser into his space anymore. Yes. He's cast him out. And how did he cast him out? By the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus ascended, that kicked the devil out of heaven. So he has no place to go but here on earth. And just like God, He needs people to operate with. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we don't battle against flesh and blood. This isn't Democrats and Republicans. This isn't black and white. This isn't male and female. This isn't gay and straight. This is a demonic spirit that is manipulating and trying to use people, amen, to bring division, to bring hatred, to bring strife. Amen. And He has no power to do it wherever we will stand up against it. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Praise God. We... We are delivered. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. We have been delivered. We have been set free. We have been saved. We're not trying to get saved. We're not trying to get in good standing with God. God has declared us the right His righteousness. Amen. And Satan has no ability to accuse us of anything because God doesn't listen to him anymore. Jesus took that, that away from the enemy. His ability to accuse. Anybody that's born again cannot be accused of anything. In fact, I think it's in, I, 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 won't, I won't say the scripture because I'll probably miss it, but what he said, what, what God said was, he that has given, who, who, if God is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. Nobody can say a thing against you. Nobody can accuse you. Nobody can find fault with you. Nobody can find guilt in you. Because if God doesn't see it, it does not exist. So, you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Praise the Lord. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of the God who hath raised Him from the dead and raised us at the same time. See, we participated in this victory. That's why Satan hates us. We kicked his rear end. We humiliated him in Christ. That's what the scripture says, that you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, yes. made you alive in him, with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's the law. Yes. Amen. And having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them and that's when he went to heaven everybody in the spirit realm saw the fall of Satan saw the humiliation of Satan saw the degradation of Satan and saw him cast out into the earth he's here now and he knows that his time is short he's already seen the handwriting on the wall he knows what God has said and he's freaking out and doing everything he can to destroy as much as possible in the time that he has left that's what we're seeing, church, in the world. Not just in the United States. Here it's obviously uh, more uh, pertinent because it's affecting us personally at the moment, right at the moment. But I'm telling you, God has already got the victory over this stuff. We have the victory in Him if we will just stand in faith and believe Him. Amen. He will cause to come to pass whatever it is He has spoken. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I tell you, the devil wants to steal our joy. He wants us freaked out. He wants us paranoid. He wants us angry. He wants us frustrated. And God is saying, look to me and have peace. The peace I'm giving you, the earth doesn't have. It doesn't have it to give. It doesn't understand it. 
My peace passes understanding. I don't have to have everything, all the ducks in a row, to be able to calm down and relax. I can look to the promise of God and know, no matter what it looks like, I'm going to have the victory. Because I already have the victory. The victory is past tense as far as we're concerned. We've already, it's already been given to us. Oh, man, every time I think about that, we were buried with Him. We were raised with Him. We are seated with Him. Do you know, can you imagine the anger that must place in the devil and why he is creating such division between the believers and the unbelievers? Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. He, that hatred, that vitriol, that, that what we're seeing every day, hearing it on the news, watching it through the media and everything else, it's just this thing playing out. It's, it's the reality of God's Word coming to pass in this world. Amen? The answer for us is to love and to trust God. And we're going to have the victory because we already have the victory. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand again. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I, 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 I just, I'm not going to get upset. I'm not letting this crap Steal my life, steal my joy, steal my living, steal my, my, you know, entertainment, the things that I enjoy, the things that I want to do, the people I want to be with. I, I'm not, I'm not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let it come to pass. I'm going to be happy. Some way, somehow, I'm going to have the joy of the Lord. I'm going to find things that will keep me happy, keep me contented, keep me positive. Amen. And I'll, I want to say that so bad, but I'm not going to. I'm just not going to let the devil take advantage. Do you know what it burns him up more than anything else? Is to see us unconcerned. Not freaking out. What, what boils him is when we just go, huh, that idiot's still at it. You know? He, he's, like, he's like the annoying little kid at the movies. Right? They don't want the movie. They don't want anything but a little popcorn and to annoy everybody else. You know, going, oh my God. That's the devil. Just a nuisance and an annoyance to us. Now, I'm not saying he's not real to people who are unsaved and that he can't do damage, but I'm saying he can't touch us. He has no authority. He has no power. He has no means by which he can take us except what we give him. Praise the Lord. So let's look at Revelation 12, verse 11. Go back there for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. I love it when God, you know, the Lord speaks to all of us in different ways. And I'm, you know, I'm the first one to admit I don't always know when it's the Lord. It's usually later. <laughs> you know? And I go, oh, yeah, that wasn't a thought I had, was it? Because you're not that bright. So this had to come from someplace, praise the Lord. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Praise the Lord. That's our testimony. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. Praise the Lord. Now I know people are, uh, there's all kinds of, are these the last days? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is he said, look up. Your redemption draws not. He said, don't look around and freak out about, is this or isn't this the last days? I mean, if it is, it's not my last days. Right? It's the beginning of the rest of eternity. It's, you know, what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not, I get it. You know, little kids and all that kind of thing. It, it's, you know, it, it can be frightening. But not if we understand who we are and our position in God. There's nothing to be afraid of. Absolutely nothing. God is not going to allow us to be tormented and destroyed. You know what? I mean, I'm going to live my life for however long that is. I don't know. I mean, we don't, this, nobody's got a guarantee for tomorrow. But I'm going to live my day today good. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to have fun. I'm not going to freak out and be paranoid and so depressed and angst about everything that's going on. I'll do what I can do. I voted. That's all I can do. I'll support in the ways that I can the people who best represent my values. And none of them do completely. I mean, not, they're all kind of scattered. 
So you find the thing that you can hold up. But here, here's what I'm voting for. Right here. You're not going to go wrong. They're not going to promise you something and then not do it. Amen. Whatever, whatever the Lord has said, He will bring it to pass. And that goes for each and every one of us. Amen. So having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. See, the devil can't accuse us. And we have our our soulish realm has been sprinkled amen with the blood as well so that we don't have to blame ourselves and, and beat up on ourselves and accuse ourselves taking the, jo the devil's job amen that God fired him from right so let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised praise the Lord so because of the blood, we always have victory. Yes. Always. No matter what it looks like. No matter what we're hearing. No matter what people are telling us. Yeah. See, it's... We always have victory, but it's when, when the soul or the mind, the will and the emotions is convinced of the power that the blood has with God. That a perfect rec reconciliation blots out sin and robs the devil of the authority that he thought he had right. takes it from him completely yes. and it gives us the assurance of the favor of God and it destroys the power of sin amen in other words where the blood of the lamb is sprinkled there God dwells yes. and Satan is put to flight yes. in heaven yes. on earth and in our hearts in our minds, in our soul. We share in the victory. We just talked about it, amen? If we've been born again, the blood of the Lamb has cleansed us and given us access to the presence of God. Amen. Re look at this again in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through 17, Peter. Revelation 12, 12 through 17. So Satan's been cast out, right? We're seated in heavenly places. He can't touch us. Let us hold fast the perfect. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. That'd be us, praise the Lord. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Now we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Right? So for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that his, he hath but a short time. Praise the Lord. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So now he's on the earth, cast out of heaven, can't touch us, but he can touch humanity, which is where Jesus came from, right? He took on the form of a human. So to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that's humans, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what we're dealing with, folks. Now, it's interesting. Keep in mind this idea of the, the, the water coming out of the, the enemy and then so forth. So we've got to recognize that we live in enemy territory. Naturally, in the earth. Praise the Lord. Satan has been cast down to earth. And he hates it because he knows his time's short. He knows things are wrapping up for him. Amen. We're in the world. We're not of the world. He is the prince of this world. He has no authority over us because we're not of this world. Amen? But all that's of the world is ready to serve him. Praise the Lord. 
That's what that's what's happening everywhere. And it's been going on, you know, I mean, it isn't like it just started. But all that's in the world is ready to serve him, to share in the victory over the devil through the blood. We've got to be fighters. Amen. It's not it's not flesh and blood we're fighting with. We need to fight the fight of faith. That's where God has brought us to. The just shall live by faith. They're, they're going to live by faith. And there, there, there isn't a question of whether you want to or not. They shall. Those that are justified shall live by faith. Amen. We are in Christ. The holiest by the blood of Jesus. Amen. There's no flesh seen there. In Christ, there's no flesh in God. When we are in Christ... The flesh has nothing to do with any of that. Amen? In fact, in Zechariah, you don't have to go there, Peter, for the sake of time, but 4, 6, it says that it's, it's uh, not by night, might or by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Praise God. The scripture says we're more than overcomers or conquerors by the blood of the Lamb and the word of God, the word of our testimony. The enemy wants us saying what everybody else is saying. He wants us repeating the same stuff. Why? Because it's the words that carry power. Either in agreement with God or with the devil. So look at Revelation chapter 2, Peter, and verses 16 and 17. And he says, repent. And of course... We're thinking that means, uh oh, I'm sorry, I did this, I did. No, we've we, our repenting is over. Amen. We have been redeemed. We have been redeemed. What he's saying is, stop thinking the way you're thinking. Change the way you're thinking. I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the hidden manna? Who, who is the overcomer? We're more than overcomers by the blood of Jesus and by the word of our testimony. And he said to him that overcomes, to us, he's going to give us to eat of the hidden manna. And we'll give him a white stone and the stone a new name written, at which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. We've received the name of God. And we've been given the hidden manna. The scripture says we are more than overcomers, right? Change the way you think. It's not about you. Is what he's saying. It's not about you anymore. It's not about religion. It's not about you keeping all the rules perfectly and doing all that stuff. Amen. We are given hidden manna. That's Jesus. That's the word of God. Jesus said your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. Right? But I'm giving you hidden manna or the word of God that's in you. God, He said I'll put my words in your heart. And in your mind. It doesn't mean we memorize the whole scripture. But the principles are in us because we're born again. So we, we operate from those, from those principles, from, those rea from that reality. So where, where is that hidden manna? It's found in the Holy of Holies. Right? Remember, God told uh, Moses, he said, put Aaron's rod, the, the rod that had budded, to show that he was called of God to be the high priest, and that the, uh, a pot of manna, golden pot that they put manna in, and it went into the ark as Memorials as historic evidence of what God had done and would continue to do. The veil is taken away in Jesus. Amen. So Ephesians 6 and 12. Let's look at this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers that have been booted out of heaven but are now operating in the atmosphere and on the earth. They're not up into the heavenlies where Paul went. That, they're out of there. They can't, they can't even approach there again. They can't go to God. They can't, you know, accuse us. They're cast down to the earth and to just the atmosphere of the earth is how that uh, translates. So we wrestle not against flesh and power, blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. And that's not just talking about in the heavenlies. We're talking about people in authority, people that have power, people that have uh, power or ruling by demonic influence. And it's, I mean, 
Look, I'm not just talking because we have, have an election going on here. I'm talking about around the world, not just here. It's everywhere. Look, I told, I, I told you, I've got my youngest daughter gave me a book. She knows I love history. She knows I like to read. So she gives me this book, and it's, it's an event that took place every day of the year. 365 days of the year, there's a historic event that took place on, on every one of those days. And so every morning, that's one of the things after I'm reading scripture and confessing and so forth. And I'll, I'll check that out, see what kind of depressing news I can get from what happened on that day, you know, 500 years ago or whatever it was. But all I'm saying is it's war after war after war after murder after assassination after, you know, just one thing after another. I'm thinking, my God, what? That's the world we live in. Yes. Amen. And it has been rocking on like this ever since time began it's it's the earth and the world the 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 the, the place where we live and I thought on the way to church this morning I was thinking about some of these things I know I'm really random here this morning but praise the Lord hang with me I was thinking about this on the way to church and the Lord Jesus lived in the most repressive country on the planet the most humiliating and degrading and manipulative, hateful. I mean, they were like slaves in their own country. They couldn't say what they wanted to say. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. They were constantly under the threat of Roman military coming and killing them and murdering and doing whatever they wanted to do because they couldn't do anything about it. And yet, what did Jesus say? Render to Caesar what's Caesar's, and God what's God's. He didn't try to overthrow the government, right? He didn't try to kill somebody or do something. He just said, I only say what my father says. I only do what my father does. He told his disciples the same thing. This isn't about people. This isn't about cultures. This is about being saved or unsaved. It's about being a child of God or a child of the devil. That's it, period. And our responsibility, since we've been reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus, he says, here's the only thing I'm asking you to do. Be a reconciler. You do what I did. You love him. You forgive him. You show mercy. God will take care of the judgment. God will take care of any any of that stuff that has to be taken care of. And he doesn't want anybody to be punished. That's why he gave us Jesus. If they choose that, it's because of many of the things that have already been said here. Arrogance, pride, lift it up. What, what does that sound like? It sounds like the devil. I'll be God. I'll ascend to the throne. I'll, take, I'll do it on my own. I'll do it my way. Great song. Lousy advice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, it's just not a good idea to think you're going to take God's place. Praise the Lord. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, but against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Praise God. First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Praise the Lord, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but don't lose hope. Be of good cheer. Don't let it freak you out. Amen? I have overcome the world. And you overcame it in me. Satan is already a conquered enemy. He has absolutely no right to destroy us or even take advantage of us except by our unbelief, our ignorance, or by letting go of the fact that we participated in the victory that cast him out of heaven. Amen. We got to keep reminding ourselves we're not the problem. We're the solution. 
Praise the Lord. Amen. And that's how we give Satan authority over us is if we f lose track of the fact that we have dominion over him. Yes. He no longer has any authority over us at all. But if we forget that, we're giving him authority that he no longer possesses. Who has authority in the earth? We do. We are the body of Christ. So where we yield authority is the only place that authority can be exercised. Amen. When we know by a living faith, I mean by daily living this thing out, that we are one with the Lord, that the Lord himself lives in us, and that Jesus maintains and continues that victory. It's an ongoing thing. Amen. And that, that victory in us, then Satan has no power over us. It's an ongoing victory. Don talked about it this, every day. Hope. We have a new hope. We have a new reason to believe positive. Because it's an ongoing victory. It never ends. Amen. It's victory through the blood of the Lamb. That's what powers our life. That's what keeps us. Amen. Yeah. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. See, we talked about this too. I was talking to Ron before ch church this morning, and I was, Eric and I were having this conversation as well. But think about this, for example. Everything in the Old Testament is, is types and shadows. We know they were historic events. We know they literally took place, but they're also pointing to something, a bigger picture, a, 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 something even more real than that. And that was in Egypt when the plagues came, when the children were dying, when everybody, you know, the firstborn were dying, and the plagues, and the frogs, and the snakes, and the lizards, and whatever else, all the junk that happened, the storms, the bad stuff, it only happened in Egypt. Now, Israel was right there in the same place, the same location. In fact, Moses floated down the river just a short ways to the Pharaoh's house, to the, to the uh, palace. They were all in the same location. But Israel wasn't touched once by any of the plagues. Never got them. Never, never, never affected them whatsoever. Frogs are dying and creating disease and all sorts of other things are going on. Israel's right there, but it didn't touch them. Because they were in Christ. They were in the protection or under the protection of God. Praise the Lord. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The blood is eternal and it's the eternal seal of what God did and the love that moved him to do it. Amen. Tim said every week, God loves you. God loves you. Of course, we've got to get this understanding. He did this because of his love for us. He gave his own life his, in a human form, amen, for us. I mean, think about, just think about that for a minute. God, the God, the eternal God, creator of everything, wanted you, loves you so much that he was willing to come and give the ultimate sacrifice of a human. And even greater than that was he gave up the glory and the majesty, majesty of heaven to come down here into a human form, go through all the junk that humans go through from childbirth all the way up through teething and everything else. You know, I mean, I used to say that's a, the great thing about Adam uh, was that he never had to go through teething. He was an adult. So I'm just saying Jesus had to go through all of that stuff. And he get, get, all the uncomfortable things that humans have to deal with. Yeah. To be humiliated. I mean, imagine the patience of the Holy Spirit in him when he's being humiliated, when he's being ridiculed. We talk about people today mocking God and, and you know, and it's going on all around us. And we know it because we see it and hear it in TV and news and just programming in general. And Jesus never once cried out, that's not fair. Or did he, like his disciples wanted to do, call down fire from heaven? No. He said, you don't understand the spirit that you're of. You do that and you're the same as they are. 
you're as demonically inspired as they. I mean, I know that doesn't give us a lot of peace sometimes because we'd rather just smack somebody in the mouth, you know. And just tell them to shut up, you know, we don't want to hear it anymore. But that's not being Christian. That's not being Christ-like. Does it, it isn't wrong to have feelings. It's just not smart to act on them all the time. Praise the Lord. Revelation 1.5 again, if you can back up to that, Peter. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. His blood is the sign of the measure or the impartation of his love. That's how he, that's how he showed us his love. There aren't enough hugs. There aren't enough kisses. There aren't enough pats on the head to show the love that God has for us. It's the blood that tells the story. Amen. Revelation 1.5, he says, From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He gave himself for us. He became sin for us. He was made a curse for us. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, 31 uh, through 33, Peter. Romans 8, 31 through 33. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. God's the only one that could, and he won't. Praise the Lord. He really gave himself by love. A love that, that longed for us. It's hard for us to get our heads around this, you know, I'm just saying. He, he longed for us. He yearned for us. He hurt for us. So that we could be identified with him forever. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Think about the, how much we love our kids. Tim talked about his sons being in the military. You just, it's hard to relax until they're home, knowing the, the, the dangers and the potential for harm. And that's how God felt about us, about humanity, for thousands of years. Can't wait for him to come back. It's like the prodigal son, like Tim's always talking about, but it's so true. He's just longing for that day for us to come back. And he knows there's only one way that can happen. I'm going to have to give my life in order to have theirs. And what parent, we don't like thinking about it, we don't dwell on those things, but what parent would not do the same thing if it came to that? If you could spare the child, you'd give your life. Or you'd put your life at risk for their safety. How much more does our Heavenly Father love us and gave himself for us? Praise the Lord. That's love. That's love that we, it's hard for us to imagine except as a parent. That's about the only kind of love that we can really equate that to. And even then, it's, it's, it's little in comparison. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Praise the Lord. This is really, it's a summary of the whole book of uh, Hebrews. And it's about the good news of God's grace and his love to us. Let us draw near. That's the center of the whole thing. That's everything that God is trying to get across to us. Think about it. First, what God has promised for us. And then second, how God prepares us for what he has prepared for us. Praise the Lord. And then he says, let us draw near. He's, he 
prepared everything for us. Health, prosperity, wholeness, healing. And then he prepares us to get it. How does he do that? By us being born again and giving us the word of God so that we can access it. It's not just random. I mean, what has God prepared for us? The holiest. Him. He is the all. The end all and the be all. In Him we live and move and have our being. That's what He prepared for us. The holiest, the holy place. The place of God. The presence of God. The reality of God. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest, let us draw near. Praise God. To bring us into the holiest is the end of the redemptive work of Jesus. We're reconnected to God where we came from, where we were before the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. What's the holiest? It's the place where God dwells. And that doesn't refer to only the symbolic symbol of the temple. And it doesn't only mean heaven. But it's the spiritual reality of God's presence. That's the holiest. And that is wherever we are. Because he has chosen to dwell in us. It has to be the holiest. Or he wouldn't be there. Amen? You read anything about the, the tabernacle and the temple, you'd see all of the effort and rigors that went into keeping that place holy. Nobody could go there. The priest once a year would go there on the Day of Atonement. And he had to be prayed and he had to be washed and sprinkled with blood. And if there were any sin in him at all, he would die in that presence. And God has opened it up and said, now you are the holiest and I'll dwell there. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 8 and 2. Praise God. Hebrews 8 and 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Praise the Lord. That's here. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So there is a material and a spiritual, right? Under the new covenant, there is a true spiritual tabernacle, and it's not confined to any location. Geography has nothing to do with it. And the holiest is where God reveals himself. Amen. Once a year, he would reveal himself to the high priest. He wants to reveal himself to us 24-7. Look at Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So what's the power? What's, how, does, how does that work? What, the power of the blood, how does it operate? Well, in Leviticus chapter 17 and 11, it says life is in the blood, right? And so the power of the blood is determined by the worth of the life. Praise the Lord. That's why when they brought the animals that were going to be sacrificed cut open and bled out they didn't check out the person who brought the animal they brought they checked out the animal because the value of that blood was determined on the worth of the animal that it was spotless it was without blemish right amen so think just think about this uh, well let's look at first Corinthians chapter 10 verse 16 
cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now Jesus said in John, I'm just going to read this quickly to save some time. Jesus said, uh, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. But my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Now I understand communion, and I'm not, I'm not arguing with the validity of communion. I'm just saying there is a, also a spiritual uh, contrast or uh, connection to that. And that is when, when we've taken the blood and the, and the body of Jesus through communion, it's what for? What's the reason? To awaken us or to cause us to think of what Jesus has done for us and what he has provided for us, whether it's healing or deliverance or whatever it might be, right? That's the reason for it. So Jesus is telling them, you've got to, it's not enough to, uh, to just believe. You're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Of course, the, the Jews were freaking out because it was, you know, blood was a, a horrible thing to them. You couldn't be out in public if a woman was having her period. If a person had open wounds or blood, they couldn't be touched. They couldn't be handled because they were unclean until that was dried up or whatever the issue might have been, right? So think about this. Think, just think of water. It has, water has a twofold effect. You can wash in it, you can cleanse yourself with it, and you can drink it, right? So if, if it's, it's used for washing and for cleansing, but if we drink it, we're refreshed, right? We're, we're renewed. Try that on a hot day and just see what I'm talking about, amen? Everybody knows the difference between washing and drinking, amen? We've been washed by the blood, but he tells us to drink the blood. So, you know, I mean, it's... It's nice to have water to wash in, and it's necessary to use water for cleans, cleansing, uh, but it's even more necessary and reviving to drink it. So without, without its cleansing, it's not possible to live healthy or happy. But without drinking it, we can't live at all. It's only by drinking it that we can enjoy the full benefit of its power to sustain us. So Jesus says, I have washed you with my blood and cleansed you. You're now whiter than snow. But something happens on the inside when we drink it in, when we receive it. It's like that's what the devil was trying to do when he spewed water out. He's trying to get us to drink his Kool-Aid. Right? I mean, that's what he was trying to do to the woman, and the earth just swallowed it up. And we can see that in the people around the world, right? But he says, for you, who have drank, and drank my blood, I give life. Not just a feel-good, not just I'm not going to hell, but I have the life of God flowing through me. Praise the Lord. I said there's two kinds of life, natural and spiritual. And Jesus becomes our life, our sustenance. By he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwells in me and I in him. Drink it in. Ever heard that expression? That's what we're doing with the Lord. We're drinking him and he becomes our life. It's great to have been cleaned. Cleansed, not be a sinner, not be judged by God as a sinner. But it's more important that I have his life living in me. And that is a conscious effort. Okay? I mean, I'm cleansed whether I know it or not, whether I feel it or not. But to drink the blood causes me to come alive in Christ or in another way to have Christ come alive in me. His life literally flows. That's what he was talking about. Life is in the blood. Unless you drink my blood, unless you take this serious, I'm not going to be of any benefit for you. you. Heaven will be your home eventually. But you'll live without life 
without God life flowing and operating in you while you're here. That's why he says, they that know me know the Father. And, if, if, and to whomever I will reveal it. How does he reveal it? By the blood. How do you get in the family? Through the blood. Bloodlines. DNA. Well, we've got heavenly DNA. We've got God's DNA flowing in us. And we have to be conscious of that in order to function the way we're supposed to function. To, we have to be revived. What we talk about every day. We've got to be thinking of this every day. I'm not saying you can't think about anything else. I'm just thinking when we go through our days, we need to be realizing God is in me. God is for me. God can change these situations. God can change these circumstances. I just need to be drinking his Kool-Aid every day, right? I know that's weird. I don't mean it that way, but you know what I'm saying. We need to be drawing off of his blood, off of his supply, off of his uh, abilities, amen, to accomplish everything and anything in this world. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we receive salvation, but we also receive sustenance and strength for life, for provision, for protection. See, Noah is a powerful picture of redemption. God's getting rid of an entire old creation that was mocking him, that was against him, that was anti-Christ. Amen? And God said, that's enough. I've had it. I'm done. i gotta, I got to get into this world somehow, and i got to have some people who are not of the enemy to have access. And so what does he do? He takes everything and puts it in the ark. Everything he wanted, he put in the ark. And the ark, every ark, is a picture of Jesus Christ. So the ark is made of wood. That's symbolic of humanity. Christ became human and was cut down out of the land of the living to be our vehicle out of this world. This world that is dominated by a curse. This world that has the devil as a prince and a ruler. What makes this boat float is the blood of Jesus seals us in it. It can't get to us, but we can get to them. Amen? We have the ability to open and go. Amen? God puts us in an ark called Christ, and then he pours out all of his wrath on it. That ark went through some junk. I mean, it was in the midst of the storms. Everything that was happening, it was right there in it, right? So God puts us in the ark, and then he pours out his wrath. But because we're in the ark, we're protected from that. What we're seeing is the consequences of sin and a rejection of God. Everywhere. But church, I'm telling you, we've been sealed by the blood of Jesus. We're in the ark, and we're seeing the chaos and all that's going on around us. But fear not. The devil will find a place to land. The flood waters will roll back, and we'll be out into the fresh and clean and purified air of God. Praise the Lord. We, we are not, we're not in jeopardy. We're in the ark. Poor world. It's a mess. But that's why Noah preached deliverance for 120 years while he was building the ark. He wasn't saying, you know, I hate all you people. Stay away from me. No, he was saying, you all have messed up. You, 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 need, you need an ark too. If you just have enough faith to realize what I'm telling you is going to happen, you'd start building the ark. You start doing something to escape the wrath that's to come. Well, we have escaped it. Our job now isn't to escape. Our job is to get more people in the ark. Stop the wrath from touching their lives. Because God doesn't want any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. Or a change of mind about God. So he puts us in the ark called Christ. He pours out his wrath on it. We didn't escape the wrath. We were in the thing that the wrath fell on. That's why we have, were raised together with him and seated in heavenly places. God sees us as having gone through the same thing Jesus went through because we believed in him. 
Amen. The blood saved us. The blood redeemed us. The blood made us a new creation. Praise the Lord. His life, His blood is in us. So, thank God for the blood. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, I remember, I, I've told this before, but a preacher friend of mine years ago, we were having a tent revival meeting in Ankeny. And he, him and his wife came to visit. And they got into a little... Uh, a little disagreement. Let's call it that. Anyway, they, because they were human. I said he was a preacher. I didn't say he was God. I said he was human. And uh, anyway, they got into this little spat. And, of course, Sally and I were standing right there. And we weren't thinking anything of it because we probably had one just like it a few minutes earlier. But beside the point. And he said, talk to me like I am somebody. That's what he said to his wife. I, I, I almost ducked because I figured there was something coming back, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying, God is saying that to us. Talk like you are somebody. You let your words have impact. Let them have power. You have authority. You, you are somebody. You are a child of God. And your words have influence and power. Yes. Use them. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, we're more than overcomers. We're coming through this, folks. We're going to get through this. And we're going to get through it just fine. It's just a question of how many can we take with us. Yes. How many can we get on board, amen, to get in the car, to get into Jesus. Yes, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. God bless you. Appreciate you. I know I was random and all over the place here this morning, but man, I'm telling you, I'm feeling this even if I can't express it. I, God wants us to understand. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors. And it's by His blood and by the words that come out of our mouth. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. Have a great week. See you next week. Talk like you are somebody while you're out there. Praise the Lord. Yeah.